بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The next sign that we're going to cover is the incident and the murders at Harra. This relates to Abdullah ibn Zubair's martyrdom. But we won't be covering his life story in detail. But because it's so interesting and so important, we'll do that next week, inshallah. But today we'll just have an overview of what happened and what was the issue. And it will just be an overview of the happenings in general, the highlights as such. Firstly, the prophecy, as this is about the signs of the last day. So firstly, there's a narration from Abu Huraira radiallahu an that by the one in whose hand is my life, there will be a major commotion and killing in Medina Munawwara, which will be called the Haliqa. Haliqa comes from the word halaq, which means to shave. Obviously, it doesn't sound right in English, the shaver, but I don't mean, and, the, and, and in this narration, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, I don't mean by Haliqa that which is going to shave heads or shave the hair of the head, but it's something which is going to shave the religion off, something that is going to remove the religion. So when that happens, then leave Medina. Even if it's just one stop away. It's also related that there's destruction for the Arabs for an evil that is about to come, from an impending evil, which will come at the at sixty years. Which will a number of things will change and completely be turned around. That sadaqa will be taken as taxes and people will only give testimony for who they know and the ruling will be based on desire. Imam Hakim has related that. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu also relates and this was his dua that oh Allah don't allow me to remain until the 60th year nor allow me to see the leadership of the youth or the young ones that we spoke about last week and he was actually indicating towards a statement a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that the destruction of my ummah will be at the hands of these young boys of the Quraysh which we covered in detail last week and at 60 this is when Yazid came along and ascended the throne as such it's related from Ayyub ibn Bashir radiallahu an that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in this harrah one of the best of my ummah will be killed after my companions one of the best of my ummah will be killed so there's a number of statements like that that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about something happening in Medina and a very special person a very blessed person being killed the reason for this is that Muawiyah as I had explained last time when he wanted to have everybody pledged for Yazid while, he, while Muawiyah was still alive he managed to get most people to do so except some of the old Sahaba and they were many of them were in the Hijaz the Hijaz is the western border of Saudi Arabia today the Hijaz is the western border of the Arabian, uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula for example Ibn Umar Ibn Abbas Abdul, uh, 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 Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr so Abdullah ibn Abbas Abdullah ibn Umar Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr 
And so in relationship to that, Muawiyah anhu had sent somebody to them and they did not respond. They did not give a favorable response. Then to Muawiyah, to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he had sent a hundred thousand dirhams. And somebody had said, why, why don't you take the pledge to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu? He said, my deen, my deen is not that cheap. I'm not going to sell my deen for that. Then he had somebody sent to Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an, And he gave him a similar response. Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr gave a very severe response and so did Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu give a very severe response. Mu'awi radiallahu anhu understood that they're not going to accept it. So when Mu'awi radiallahu anhu was on his deathbed, he said to Yazid that I've prepared the lands for you. I've gone around and I've prepared the lands for you. And it's all simplified and it's all been prepared. But I, and I have no fear from anybody except the people of Hijaz. If you do have an issue with them, if after my death you do have an issue with them and they still desist, for example, then use Muslim ibn Uqba. Muslim ibn Uqba is someone that I have tested and somebody who I know to be extremely faithful. So he will be the best person for you to use. So when Muawiyah radiallahu anhu passed away, and then the whole incident of Hussein radiallahu anhu took place, which we discussed already last week, Ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu, and this, again this is just highlights, Ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu decided that he needed to deal with Yazid. So after Karbala, after what had happened with Hussein radiallahu an and the sad, sad events of that time when he returned back to Makkah and Medina, when he returned back, back to Medina Munawwara, people took, ple- took the pledge on the hands of Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an. This is very general because there's more detail than that. And despite the fact that some people had taken the pledge with Yazid earlier on during Muawiyah radiallahu anhu's time, now they gave that up to Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an. And according to some narrations, the family of Marwan, who were in that area, they were besieged. And they wrote to Damascus saying that we need help because this is what's happened to us. Because they were great supporters in the same family as Yazid. So Yazid sent towards them Muslim ibn Uqba in 12,000 people. Some say maybe it was 20,000. 12 or 20,000. And he, this is, these are the instructions he gave, and this has gone down in the history as one of the worst things that he did. Or among, it's in the list of the worst things that, as he did. And some people have written that even if he was to wash it with blessed water, he would not be able to wash it of his, of his deeds. You've got, I mean, there is, a, a, there, there is, although the majority would say that Yazid was extremely bad. And then you've got an extreme that call him kafir. But that's not the opinion of the majority. The majority say that he's a great sinner. He did a lot of evil things. And yet you've got another side that considers that everything he did, there was a reason he did it. And it wasn't really as bad as, as, as it's been made out. That these were other people that had committed the aggression. And he was sitting back in Damascus and he didn't know. His, his thing was to deal with people lightly, but people were doing that. However, the majority opinion of the majority of scholars is that, yes, definitely he was a sinner and he was not the right person for this. So this was one of the worst things that go into the list of the worst things that he has, which is that he said that go, go, to, Mac, uh, go to Medina Munawwara and call on them for three days. Give them, a, give them respite for three days. If they turn back from their position and they relent, then that's fine. Otherwise, fight with them. If you are able to overcome Medina, then it is permissible for you. Remember, Medina Munawwara is a haram, which is a sanctified area, according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Makkah is a haram that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has made sanctified. There are certain special laws that govern those areas, with, especially Makkah is even more than Medina Munawwara, the haram areas. But who would think of doing anything like that in Makkah and Medina Munawwara? But this was his statement. His statement was, that, and this seemed to be kind of something similar, it seems, that what he was trying to do. Like in Makkah Mukarramah, 
it was not permissible to fight, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had permitted it for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the conquest of Makkah took place, he, he was permitted for a moment of time to go and do what he had to do and to kill whoever were the severe rebels and so on and so forth. But then after that, the hurma, the sanctified position of that place of Makkah Mukarramah had returned and it's not for anybody else to do it. To, to release it and to take it away. But this was one of the statements of Yazid. Yazid is the same person that when he gave his first khutbah, he actually laid, laid out his plan. The interesting thing is that he was not present when his father had passed away. And then he only came in after his father had been shrouded and then he prayed on him afterwards. And then he ascended the mimbar and he gave a khutbah. And he said that my father had started the marine campaigns. This is, he had started this armada at sea to, uh, you know, to um, deal with many of the aggressions around. And I will not be doing that anymore. I will not be sending out people on ships to go and uh, wage, you know, uh, wage the jihad as such. And then he mentioned the number two, two or three other things, which for the common folk that just wanted to relax and just, you know, enjoy life, was very good, so he won a lot of people over by doing these kind of things. But basically, he's one of the first who kind of gave up the strict attitude and the religious and pious attitude of his forebearers, including his father. Because the ten years that his father was around were glorious, in a sense. Right? There was great unity, and there was great unity and expansion, and uh, there was a number of good things that came about at that time. But as soon as he came in, he had laid out a different plan. It seems like he was in, in interested in other things and he was not interested in the real matter. There were other things that interested him more than, more than this. So he said in this to Muslim ibn Uqba when he was sending him to Medina Munawwara that give them three days and if they don't relent and they don't come around then you will fight with them. And if you do over, overcome the area if you're able to get in then, it is, then consider it permissible for you, consider it lawful. It's not the sanctification of that place will be removed. That's, that's a real major statement. Allow it for your army three days. And go after those of them who will have lost. And so they, this army reached Medina Munawwara in Dhil Hijjah in 63 Hijri. 63 Hijri it reached Medina Munawwara. There's a lot of story about exactly what happened before that, but again, we're just giving the overview here. And they began to fight with the people in Medina. Now, there's numerous narrations about what they did. And there's some very extreme narrations about what they did, and the raping and pillaging and so on. We're going to take all of that with a grain of salt, because you've got people on both sides. There are people who love one side a lot and they will actually fabricate a lot about the other side and then you've got people who are supporters of the other side who will fabricate much about this side that's why these matters are very difficult to determine as to exactly what the truth is because there are numerous narrations from both sides that have come down to us from people and witnesses and eyewitnesses and people who've heard hearsay and some are extremely extreme and I'd rather not mention some of those extreme ones. But the Amir for the people of the Ansar, for the people of Medina, was Abdullah ibn Hanzala. Abdullah ibn Hanzala was the son of Hanzala, the one who was washed by the angels. And you must know that story that Hanzala radiallahu an, who had just been married and consummated with his wife, the call for jihad came on and he immediately left without having a bath and when he was martyred and water was seen trickling off him and it was told, it was, it was informed that the angels had washed him. So his son was the leader of them. These are all very prominent people. Then on the Quraysh, there was Abdullah ibn Muti. And on the others of the different tribes there, there was Ma'kal, Ma'qil ibn Sinan, another great, Al-Ash'i, another great person. And they had actually dug a khandak. They had dug a large trench uh, for their protection around Medina. When the people of Sham saw this, that is, these three people, they, they were a bit fearful about it, and they didn't want to fight with them. And the Banu Haritha, they got a group of people from the Shamiyin into, from a side of the trench, they, they managed to get them into, the, into Medina Munawwara. 
Now, when they began to hear the takbirs inside, remember they were Muslim, they were both sides of the Muslims, so they're giving takbir. The people who were on the outskirts, they felt that they're gonna, you know, they have to go and protect their family, so they, they went out, and that, uh, sorry, they went into Medina again. So that's why you can say the defense of Medina fell, Medina Munawwara fell. They entered, and that's how Medina was lost at that time, in a sense that it was attacked and it was overcome by the forces of Yazid. Muslim did exactly according to the instructions of Yazid, and he made Medina, as, as I say, lawful, you know, in inverted commas, for three days in which people were killed left, right, and center indiscriminately. And they saying that there was reports of rape and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Abdullah ibn Muti, he fought as, fast, uh, you know, as far as he could until he was killed. And may, uh, seven of his children were killed as well. And his, his head was sent to Yazid. And then there were a number of other great, great people that lived in Medina Munawwara that, that were killed. Um, 700 of them from the Quraysh. And uh, there were many others from young people, old women and children that were killed as well. 10,000 people according to some reports. And there's even reports that they took their horses into the masjid and tied them onto the pillars and so on. And it was all dirty. And, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wallahu a'lam. You don't find that in most reports. Wallahu a'lam. One thing though is that the, the chaos was so great. And it was such a serious matter that was taking place outside that the, there wasn't much prayer inside the Masjid al-Nabawi for three days. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, who is considered the leader of the Tabi'een, one of the prominent Tabi'een, he was in i'tikaf in the Masjid as such. He remained in the Masjid. And he says that, I used to hear from the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, adhan an iqama. From the grave of the Prophet ﷺ because there was no jama'ah taking place. And people used to laugh at me. That what kind of a insane person is this who's just sticking around here. And the reason for that is that the occupiers came in. And they wanted, you know, they were forcing everybody to take the pledge for Yazid. So they came in and they saw Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Rahimahullah. And they said to him that we want you to take the pledge for Yazid. That you will be a slave of Yazid. The pledge is that you will take it as being a slave of Yazid and you will have to follow him and be obedient to him whether he tells you to do good or bad. So he said, no, I, if I take the pledge, it's going to be ala kitab Allah wa sunnati nabihi wa sirati Abi Bakri wa Umar radiyallahu anhuma. That if I take the pledge, it's going to be on the book of Allah and the sunnah of his Nabi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and according to the way and seerah of Abu Bakr and Umar radiyallahu anhu. So they said, kill him. But some onlookers there, they said, you know what, leave him alone, he's insane. They passed him off as insane, that oh, he's just, he's just sticky, uh, you know, stuck in a machine, leave him alone, he's an insane man. So he was spared. But anybody that rejected that, they were, they were taken care of by them, and they were put under great persecution or killed. One person that they did not touch was the son of Hussein radiallahu an. If you remember that Yazid had treated Zainul Abidin, whose name was Ali ibn al Hussein, Ali, the son of Hussein, his name was Ali, like his grandfather's name. So they didn't touch him because that was something that Yazid had very strongly counseled about and told him about that you don't touch him because you know they'd already had their they'd already had the, uh, their discussions beforehand and uh, he had uh, treated him well afterwards. This Muslim ibn, what's his name? Muslim ibn Uqba, he, his name is Muslim ibn Uqba, but they began to call him Musrif ibn Uqba. Musrif, the word Musrif comes from Israf. Israf means excessive, excessive, a terrorist, basically. So because he was excessive in everything, he, I mean, when he, you know, he, he used to basically carry out the orders in an excessive manner, you know, adding stuff from his own self in a sense. Then they tried to go after Ibn Zubayr radiallahu an, Because Yazid had told him that when you finish with Medina Munawwara, then go towards Makkah because Abdullah ibn Zubayr had gone to Makkah now. And he had chosen Makkah. Out of all of the places in the Muslim lands, he had chosen Makkah after Medina Munawwara. He couldn't choose, obviously he couldn't choose Kufa because he's the one who had told Hussein radiallahu anhu not to go there in the first place. He couldn't choose... 
Yemen and that he could have chosen those areas but those were kind of far away from where the action was going to be so it wouldn't really help him politi- politically it wasn't a good move Sham, there would be no benefit in choosing Sham because that was the house of the Umayyads so the only option he really had was Makkah Mukarramah so he went to Makkah Mukarramah and he had, he had chosen that now after Medina Munawwara they this force is heading towards Makkah Mukarramah but in the midst of all of that Yazid dies Yazid dies and there's a number of statements about what he said and what he did during that time as well but we'll just leave that alone for now and he, before he died he called on to Hussein ibn Numair and he said to him that quickly go and don't allow ibn Zubair to escape and go and if you have to use catapults against, against Makkah then, then do that so then Hussein ibn Numair asked him that what about if he takes refuge in the Kaaba if he takes refuge with the house of Allah so that still attack him so he was after him it didn't matter what, what it took so they went and they besieged Makkah for 64 days that's about over two months they besieged Makkah for 64 days Abdullah ibn Zubair was doing very well in the beginning in the sense that he had everything under control but because of the siege and because there were no supplies coming in and so on and so forth that's when people began to they, they weren't able to keep their strength up with him and there was a number of battles that took place during that time Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was sent as well so they catapulted the house with, uh, you know, they, they basically attacked the house with catapults. And somebody put on, on one of the heads, they made a kind of a missile in a sense that they put an ember. And that caused the house of Allah to burn. So the house of Allah was burned down. So you can imagine Masjid al-Nabawi without Salat for three days. And then you can imagine that Makkah, the house of Allah is burned down. And this is by Muslims. And that's when they, you know, that they had heard about Yazid. When they heard about Yazid dying, the people of Makkah and Medina Munawwara got a lot of him. They, their bravery was increased, and they stood up. And then after that, they attacked the forces, and the forces had to leave. So that, that's in general, the forces had to leave. Now, in the midst of that, when Muawiyah, when Yazid passes away or dies. His son, whose name was Muawiyah ibn Yazid, people take the pledge, people want him to be the next Amir, so they take the pledge with him. Now he's a very straightforward, very sensible, extremely pious man, very pious man, the pious of the lot. And he is very intelligent about that as well. He stood up, he, he, he stood, you know, he kept that position for about 40 days. Or five months and some days, Allah knows best exactly the amount of time. But a number of people have mentioned that before he was about to give up, he climbed up the mimbar and he sat there for a very long time. And then, you know, all the dignitaries and everybody's there. First, he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do that in the beginning of a khutbah, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extensively. And then he mentioned the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the best way possible that anybody could mention and then he said oh people I'm not someone who covets this position of being the Amir upon you because of the great feeling of dislike I have for what you have done or something that I dislike in you and I know that you don't like me either because we have been tested by you and you have been tested through us my grandfather Muawiyah, he disputed with, in this matter with someone who was higher than him. Someone who was better than him or more rightful than him. And also somebody who was closer to the Prophet ﷺ, who was better in his virtue, who was earlier in his embracing of the religion, who was one of the best of the muhajireen, of the migrators and one of the most brave-hearted ones, and one of the most knowledgeable ones, and one of the first in Iman, and one of the most noble in terms of status, and one of the earliest in terms of companionship, the nephew of the Prophet sorry, the 
cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and his son-in-law, and his brother, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him his daughter to marry, and made him her husband, and then made her his wife. He was he was really like, I mean, you, you made her his uh, his wife and made him her husband. So he was really like explaining their virtue and really highlighting their virtue. And he is the leader, he's one of the best of this ummah, and they're from a very good family, very pure family. And then my grandfather did what he did, which you know about. And then you guys did, which you are not ignorant of. Until all the matters became settled for my grandfather, until matters settled in the Muslim ummah. So he was basically just talking about the whole history of things in a nutshell. And then when the final state came, when the final time came for my grandfather and the death overtook him, he was left, he was left as a, as a pawn with his, through his actions. So he was, he was left basically to give a response for his actions, alone in his grave. And he found there what he had sent forth. Then the Khilafah moved over to Yazid. He took care of your affairs. My father Yazid was not. My father Yazid, because of the evil of his actions and his excess against him himself, meaning his concern more for himself, was not suitable for the Khilafah over the, over the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this was in front of all the Umayyads. His father just died and he's making this very clear. He followed his, he, he, mount, he mounted his desires and he liked his step, the steps that he took. And he then did and embarked on what he did with his boldness against Allah and his transgression over those whose nobleness and whose respect he, ran, he tore open from the children of the Prophet ﷺ. So his time was very short and his, his information has passed. His time has passed and he became the companion of his grave. And he became under the command of his, his bad deeds. And then he was remorseful when remorse could not benefit him anymore. So I don't know what, what he said, I don't know what was said of him, whether he's been punished for his sins or whether he's been given the good deeds of what he's done, the rewards for the good deeds he's done. That's my opinion. And then after that, he was overcome. Muawiyah ibn Yazid, he was overcome. And he began to weep and cry until, his, until the sounds he was making became very high. And then he said, I then became the third of this line, or the third of, this peop of these people. And those who are angry and unhappy with me are more than those who are happy with me. But I'm not going to carry your sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose majesty is great, is not going to see me carry your sins and have them around my neck. I'm not going to go and meet him with your baggage. Take your matter for yourself, deal with it for yourself, and take it from here. And whoever you're happy with, and whoever you're pleased with, then make him the Khalif, make him the Amir. I am taking, I am shedding from myself all of the people who've taken pledge with me. I am taking, I am basically removing that pledge from my neck for all of you. Wassalam, and peace be upon you. So Marwan Abdul Hakam was sitting there. Now remember, Marwan is advanced. He's been around for a while. So he said, he was just there under the mimbar. He said, that is this sunnah Umariya? Is this sunnah of Umar, ya Aba Layla? So Muawiyah ibn, uh, ibn, ibn Yazid said, move away from me. And are you trying to deceive me from my deen and from my religion? By Allah, I have not tasted the sweetness of your khilafah so that I may drink its bitterness. Bring for me people like the people of Umar radiallahu anhu, so that the way he made 
at his death when he gave the khilafa and he left it to be in between six people as a shura between them. He said, if the khilafa was a way to earn booty, then my father has earned it and a lot of sins. And if it was bad, then it's sufficient whatever he's got. And then he came down, he descended from the mimbar. His mother and his relatives, they came and they, they found him crying. His mother didn't have much good to say about him. But he said that this is exactly what I wanted by Allah. This is exactly what I wanted. Because his mother was trying to give him himmah, what are you doing? He said, this is exactly what I want. And then he said, my destruction if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have mercy on me. It was almost as if he was carrying the sin of his people, of his father before him. Then the Banu Umayyah, they accosted his teacher, whose name was Amr al-Maksus. He was the teacher of Muawiyah ibn Yazid. They accosted him and they said, you're the one who's been teaching him all of this. And you're the one who's been teaching him to say these things and blocking him and preventing him from being the Khalif. And you're the one who has made him drink the love of Ali and his children and incited him to say about us all these defective things about us, about oppression and so on. And you're the one who made him say all of these things. And they said whatever they said. He said, Wallahi, it was not me. I did not do any of that. But he is by nature, this is his nature, that he by nature he is... He has a propensity towards these things. And he is just by nature on the love of Ali radiallahu an. They didn't accept that. And according to some narrations, they buried him alive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. After that, Muawiyah ibn Yazid passed away. After he had given up the bay'ah, after he had given up the bay'ah, and that speech he did, maybe after 90 nights, maybe after 3 months, his, he was only 23 years old. But such a such a pious and intellectual person despite coming from that environment and seeing all of that that he had woken up and seen the truth and some say he was some say he was 21 some say he was only 18 and some say he was 20 so he was around that age he was around 20 20 something when he was about to die he said somebody asked him aren't you going to give aren't you going to have somebody else name somebody else in your place he said no he made it very clear. He said the same thing. He said that I haven't tasted the sweetness. Why should I drink its bitterness? I've never tasted any sweetness from this Khilafah. If I make somebody else, then I'm going to have to take the bitterness of it as well. So the killing of the murder of Zubair. Sorry, the, the, the murder of Abdullah ibn Zubair. The, murder, the, the, the incident of Harra in which Medina Munawwara was just ravaged in a sense. And attacking the Kaaba with the catapults and considering it to be lawful to do so. All of that goes into the, the list of things that were committed by Yazid. Now the thing is that, if you look at a few other things, Yazid, after killing Hussein radiallahu an, and even after Harra, after Medina Munawwara, where many of those who could have been Khalif were killed. Not many prominent people were killed during that time. The people of Makkah still did not give bay'ah to him. And they remained with Ibn Zubayr radiallahu an. After, after Muawiyah ibn Yazid, died, the people around, many people gave bay'ah to Ibn Zubair radiallahu an. So it says that he had hijaz under him. So this is between Mecca and Medina, right? Uh, you know, uh, he had hijaz under him and they thwarted the people from Mecca uh, afterwards, right? Likewise, Yemen, Misr, Iraq. And some say they even eventually, the people of Sham gave bay'ah to him as well. And it was just a small group of the real close family of the Umayyads that remained without it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Right? I'll, send, I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you some other uh, versions next week inshallah. But so much so that even Marwan was considering to go and give bay'ah to Abdullah ibn Zubair. However, the Banu Umayyah, they prevented him from doing so and they made him the Khalif and they gave him the bay'ah. So now you've got Marwan on the other side. And on this side, you've got Abdullah ibn Zubair. So it looks like before Muawiyah, you know, you had Ali radiallahu an and Muawiyah radiallahu an. Although Muawiyah was not officially Khalif at that time, uh, and there was this tussle that was going on. 
right? It was more of an argument about avenging, uh, avenging Uthman radiallahu anh, and then Hassan radiallahu anh just gave it up, and it was all cleared. And now you had again these two things that were going on parallel. So you had Marwan now who's taking it up on that side. There's always going to be elements within each family that are going to be even more, even if we were to take the fact that maybe Marwan did go, was intending to go and just, because he was, he was okay with Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anh in the beginning. But it didn't work. They, they gave the bayah to Marwan. Now, it was the year 65, and Marwan died in 65. Because Marwan was quite old, so Marwan died in 65. So he was, un, you know, things remained under him for about six months. He left it to his son, Abdul Malik. Now, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was a very interesting man. Because he was an alim. He had studied. He was a poet. I mean, he was an incredible person in the sense that he had studied a lot. So he was a faqih. And, you know, he had... Uh, you know, he had a number of uh, sciences under his belt as such. He used to read the Qur'an as well for long periods of time. But it looks like the emirship got to his head after he became the Khalif. He was the one who brought the matter together again and the disarray. Even though he was not the rightful person, but he brought it back together again. He got back the Mulk sham The sovereignty of Sham was, came under him and Egypt and uh, North Africa. And Ibn Zubair had Yemen, Hijaz, Iraq, and some of the eastern parts. Except that Mukhtar ibn Abi, Abdul, uh, Abi Ubaid had overcome Kufa. And they had a different call that they were waiting for the Mahdi from the Ahlul Bayt to come and so on. And they were saying that Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya should be the person. And there, there, there was some other crazy idea on that side. That was about two years that that took place. And then Mus'ab ibn Zubair. Abdullah ibn Zubayr's brother, Musa ibn Zubayr, who was the Amir of Basra, for his brother Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he went and he dealt with that area, uh, Kufa, until that man was killed. Um, Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid was killed in Ramadan in 67. So as you can say from 60, it's gone to 67 now. So all of Iraq came under ibn Zubayr. And that remained until 71. Abdul Malik. Ibn Marwan went to Mus'ab. Eventually, Abdul Malik decided that he needs to deal with the matter. So, he sent an army to Mus'ab ibn Zubayr, who was in Basra, in Iraq. And he was killed uh, in that year. So, Iraq came under Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So, now Ibn Zubayr, all he had was what? He had the Hijaz and Yemen. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan got Hajjaj on his case. The evil Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi And again, I'm just going to give the highlights here. He besieged Abdullah ibn Zubayr for about seven... Uh, you know, in, in 72, this was in 72 Hijri. He besieged him in 72 Hijri until he managed to kill Abdullah ibn Zubayr in Jumad al-Ula, 73 Hijri. And... The entire time of the Khilafah of Abdullah ibn Zubayr while he was in that position was nine years and some, some time. After that, again this is very general, but after Abdullah ibn Zubayr there was nobody there. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan has Makkah, Mukarramah now as well. So everybody gathered onto Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So you can say unity in a sense was restored. And the thing about it is that regardless of whether somebody is right or wrong, unity is extremely beneficial. So the fact that there was unity again, it helps the cause of Islam. Because the enemies cannot pitch each other against you and they cannot glory in that. So the point is that regardless of how it came about, the fact that the Muslim Ummah was one again is really talking about something. It's, it's, it's the stability that was very, very important. So after Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, again this is not a history lesson, but after Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, it went to uh, his son Walid. So Abdul Malik is the son of Marwan. He had a brother Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan. And so from Ab Marwan he goes to Abdul Malik, his main son. From Abdul Malik he goes to his son Walid. And then from Walid, when he dies, 
it goes to his brother Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, Abdul Malik's other son Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik. Now when Sulaiman is about to die, his son is too young and maybe there's no brothers left. So his son is too young, he tries to put long clothes on him to make him look big and so on, it doesn't work out. So then it goes to his cousin brother. And that was just like somebody at the last moment before he died says, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So it was just, um, he just said it. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the son of Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan, becomes a khalif. And then after that, it goes to his other son, Yazid. He didn't stay with Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He, just, he was there for about two years and some months. And they say he was poisoned by the family because he really cut their line of supply as such. And so he go, it, then he went to his other son Yazid and then to another one called Hisham. And all of these were the sons of Abdul Malik except Umar. So after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he went to another son of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, which is Yazid. And then he went to Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. So four sons. One is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And then he went to his son who? Walid ibn Abdul Malik. And then Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik. And then Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And then to, to who? Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. And then to Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. So these are all the children of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan except Umar, uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And then after Hisham, it was his cousin Walid ibn Yazid who took it on. And he stayed on there until his cousin Yazid ibn Walid killed him. This is the Umayyad story. Yazid ibn Walid kills Walid ibn Yazid. It looks like these names were very Walid, Yazid. These were very prominent names among them. Then comes another Marwan, Ibn Muhammad Ibn Marwan. And then when he died, his brother Ibrahim came on. And then another Marwan overcame him. And then the Banu Abbas took over. Then starts the dynasty of the, the Abbasids. And they, they really killed a lot of the Banu Umayyads at that time. But for Allah is praise in the beginning and at the end. And that's, that's, this, that's the general overview of that. Now what we'll do is, since we have some time, we'll start off the story of Abdullah ibn Zubayr and then we'll mention the rest of it in detail next time. But now you understand the general, because if we get bogged down into the story first and you won't understand exactly what happened, and I think it's very important for us to understand who comes first, who comes afterwards, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them and how things have lived on, because it gives us guidance for our current situation and things that we may see in the future. Because everything that's happened in the past the history has a bearing for us. Nothing is unique. Human beings are very generic people. In the sense that whatever's happened a hundred years ago will happen again. Because the same human being, you know, they're not new human beings. Same things. They'll do the same things. They'll go into the same kind of decadence that earlier people have come. Punishments will come. And that's why some people say that if you've heard of Pompeii and the great Vesuvius um, volcano, and they said that the problem with Pompeii, which is not normally mentioned, is that they had gotten to an extreme low. And some people, some analysts have actually started seeing many similarities between there and our current situation in certain countries. And how they were entirely destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to give, do amr bil ma'ruf nahi an munkar, to an abstain from the harams and the ills and the wrongs. Because if the punishment comes, it comes on to all of us. So at least if we are to die in the middle somewhere, at least in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can be as clean as possible. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us. Now going back to Abdullah ibn Zubayr's story, Abdullah ibn Zubayr was an extremely blessed individual. Started off in a very blessed state. And the reason for that is that the people of Medina, you know, you have three major Jewish tribes in Medina Munawwara who had gone there after the, after the diaspora, after the Romans ransacked Jerusalem in 71 after Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, 71 after Isa alayhi salatu wasalam departed from this world and ascended to the heavens. They completely destroyed Jerusalem and whatever Jews managed to escape the Bani Israel, three tribes came to Medina Munawwara because they identified that as the place of the coming of the promised prophets. Because you had the palm trees and the, as was mentioned in their books. 
So you had the Banu Quraidha, you had the Banu Nadir, and you had the Banu Qaynuqa. And they were extremely wealthy and uh, they had a lot of wealth uh, and very well established in Medina Mana. Now when the Muslims, uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, migrated, when, people, when the people of Medina Mana, the Aus and the Khazraj began to embrace Islam, and the Muslims began to migrate there from Mecca Mukarrama. They had the Jews had the, 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 there was a rumor that the Jews had laid a curse on the Muhajireen that none of them would have children anymore. And after that curse was heard about, they said that for three days nothing happened. There were no child, no children born in the Muhajireen. And finally, Asma binti Abi Bakr as Siddiq radiyallahu anha, just such a an absolutely fantastic woman she was, an incredible woman. Because she is the same woman as a young girl with Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha at the migration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is probably about seven, eight years old. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa married her, did nikah with her before migration. And then she came into his uh, consummation. Uh, they consummated the marriage after migration. So she was nine when they consummated. She was, she was, the nikah was then at six. So she's about seven, eight. Asma radiallahu anha was probably older than her. Very, very... Very sensible, very intellectual person, the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu accompanies the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to Makkah, to Medina Munawwara from Makkah in their migration, as you know. So he takes everything. He he take he took all the wealth because they they needed it on the way. So the grandfather Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's father Abu Quhafa, who's blind now, he's like, where's your father gone? He's left us nothing. So Asma radiallahu anha kept hearing this from him. So she said, let me deal with this. So what she did was she put a, a pile of small stones uh, on, uh, on the sill uh, and, and put a cloth over it and then brought her grandfather over and put his hands over it and said, look, he's left us all of this, right? So then he was happy, okay, he's left you a lot. So that's what he did. Now, um, she's also the one who prepared the food for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, you know, the, the, the provisions for the way. And because there was nothing to tie it up in, she took off her belt, <coughs> nitaq. You call that nitaq? She took off her belt and she tore it into two to make a pouch for the Prophet ﷺ's provisions with her father. And that's why she was called the Dhatun Nitaqain, the one of the two belts. Somebody just started a company called nitaq.com, N-I-T-A-Q, selling jubbas and things like that, Islamic garments. This is quite a good idea, I think. Right. So anyway... Um, that was done. Now, so she's, you know, an incredible person. Now, she marries none other than Zubair ibn al-Awam. Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu an. And he's one of the, the Ashara. He's one of the ten. And not only that, he's one of the bravest men out there. Right? And it's not the time to talk about his entire biography. But in one of the, the major battles against the Romans. Does anybody know which one it is? In the Battle of Yarmouk. Right? In the Battle of Yarmouk. Now, Let's get back to, she, she marries Zubair. Now Zubair is great, and I'll talk about this Yarmouk afterwards. But let's let Abdullah ibn Zubair be born. So Asma radiallahu anha is now married to Zubair radiallahu anha, and she's pregnant. And in that state she migrates from Makkah to Medina Munawwara. They get to Quba, and uh, just after three days or so of the, the rumors about the curse, she gives birth to Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. Now you can imagine the happiness of the Muslims, both the Ansar and the, especially the Muhajireen. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. That, that's a sign that this curse is, it's, it's all false. So, Abdullah ibn Zubayr is born and she takes him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he's born, everybody's like, Allahu Akbar, the takbirs are up there. So the day he's born, the takbir goes up. You know, the, 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 the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is elevated. She takes him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's taken to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives him a tahniq. So the first thing that enters into his mouth is the saliva of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he chooses, she, he asks for a date. It took Asma radiallahu anhu about an hour to find a date. Finally, when she comes back with it, he softens it and puts it into the child's mouth. And so that's the first thing, that's the first morsel, the first food that he gets is uh, accompanied by the saliva of the Prophet ﷺ. So you can see where this is all going. People are extremely happy that, uh, that he's born. And the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu anha didn't have children as you know. 
So later on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually requested that he be brought up in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. His sister's son, you know, they can get along very well. So that's why Aisha radiallahu anha loved Abdullah ibn Zubayr to a, an extreme degree. This is just very beloved to him, uh, beloved to her. So you can see that this, he's learning a lot from this because he's getting the benefit of one of the main wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most beloved wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So his nurturing is extremely, is extremely great in that sense. It's also related that he was once told by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to go and dispose of a vessel of blood that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had of his, of his own, after cupping, after a cupping um, session. There was somebody who said, okay, go and get rid of this, go and you know, put, put it somewhere. So he went around, he just couldn't find a place, and then he drank it. A young man, a young boy at that time. So he came back, he says, where's it gone? Some say that Salman Farsi radiallahu anhu was there, and he said, he's, he's drank it. Right? So he says, I put it where nobody will, able to be get it, uh, will, nobody will be able to get it. He said, where's that? He said, I drank it. So the Prophet ﷺ said, well, you've got a lot of tests coming to you, but you know, you'll be... The Prophet ﷺ mentioned a number of things about him at that time. Now, his father was a great nurturer of him in all sense, and he was a very brave man. So in, during the Battle of Yarmouk, when the Muslims were only 30,000, that's a quite a large number compared to 313 at Badr. But when you compare that to about 150 or 200,000, according to some Romans, right, and you've got 30,000 Muslims in front of them, right. So... Khalid radiallahu was the commander, but Zubair radiallahu was very acting, you know, very prominent. And he said, okay, who's going to give me the pledge till death that we will go and fight? So a group of people got ready and he went with them. They were all killed except him. He came back and he said, come on, who's going to volunteer? Who's going to give me the pledge until death? So again, another group stood up and they went and they fought very bravely, but they were eventually all killed except martyred except him comes back for the third time and he says, okay, who's going to come with me and pledge, uh, give me a pledge till death and we'll go in there. This time nobody stood up. So what, because they'd seen what had happened. So this time what he did was he got onto a horse with his 10-year-old son Abdullah ibn Zubair behind him, 10-year-old son. And he took two swords, one in each hand. And they say that there were only two people that could do that. One was him and one was Khalid bin Walid who could fight with two, two swords at once. And he went in there, and then the people followed, obviously, and they thwarted this enemy. Right, these 150 to 200,000, he thwarted them. So, you can see where Abdullah ibn Zubair is. You can see how Abdullah ibn Zubair, 10-year-old kid, who's going to take their 10-year-old son? Then they heard the news of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's death in Medina Munawwara. So they went back. They went back. When they'd gone back, now Zubair radiallahu after that wanted to go back in, into the, the jihad and he wasn't allowed to take Abdullah ibn Zubair. Umar radiallahu said that he should stay with his mother, Asma, because she's alone. So he should stay with Asma and now she was um, uh, at home. So he said he should stay with Asma radiallahu Now he starts benefiting from Aisha. He was a student of Aisha radiallahu and starts benefiting from Aisha radiallahu anha as well. When he was about 15 years old now, he was playing with some of the local boys there in Medina Munawwara and it's Umar radiallahu's caliphate. So Umar was going around and people are extremely frightened of Umar radiallahu an. Children move out of the way. So when they saw Umar radiallahu coming once, they all ran except Abdullah ibn Zubair who stood there. So Umar radiallahu an looked at him and he said, why didn't you go? Why didn't you run away? He said, well, I haven't committed a sin that I should go and hide. Right? I haven't committed a sin that I should go and hide. And uh, so that was his response to Umar radiallahu an. And then he said also that the road isn't so narrow that you know you can't pass, and I have to make some space for you to pass. So Umar radiallahu an just looked at him in a, you know just looked at him in in wonder and just said, you know what, you're the son of your father. You're definitely the son of your father. That that was just his statement. So now when he grows up and he sees this whole turmoil, he doesn't agree with Yazid at all. So he's one of those that doesn't pledge. And then when he sees the killing of Hussein radiallahu anh, he decides to take the matter in his hands. So he goes to Makkah Mukarramah as I said. And that's when uh, Yazid tried to play it uh, calmly first by sending him a letter and saying this, that and the other. At that same time Marwan also sent him a letter and said, look I'm a well-wisher of yours. And what had happened is 
Yazid tried to tell him, look, do it, you know, you, you've got a lot of respect, you've got a lot of honor, you've got a lot of virtue. He reminded him all the virtue and so on. He goes, look, let's just make this easy. Abdullah ibn Zubayr said, no, he, his response was in a negative. Right? He sent a delegation. Uh, no, then Yazid got really angry. So he said, I'm going to bring him back in shackles to me. I'm not going to accept it now, even if he comes, you know, I'm not going to accept it now until he comes to me in shackles. Right? And tied. So, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, now then he sends a delegation. Yazid sends a delegation of a number of prominent people from... Uh, because this Muawiyah ibn Yazid, Mu Yazid's son is telling like, you know, he, he, is, he, had, he, had, he, had, he actually had a connection with Abdullah ibn Zubayr. They, they, they knew each other. And he really liked him and he's telling his father, why, why have you taken this oath? Just, just break the oath and so on and so forth. So then finally, a number of other people as well did the same. And Marwan wrote to him that, look, I'm your... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you out. Just, just do what Yazid says. In fact, what Yazid finally relented and said, "Okay, fine, we'll make it easy." He, 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 he can come, not in heavy shackles. But they said that he actually sent a gold shackle or something like that, and he said that you know we'll make it nice for him so that I'll fulfill my oath, and at the same time he'll you know he, he'll he'll succumb to me as well. But Abdullah ibn Zubayr went and made mashallah with his mother, and his mother said that if you want to die a noble person then you can't listen to them because if you listen to them they're going to make a mockery of you afterwards they're going to treat you like dirt there's no way that you could do it so he had three options basically and uh, he took the option that he's going to go f go all out against them he's not going to he's not going to accept so he sent a letter to marwan saying jazakallah khair thank you very much you know i uh, for your advice but you know no i can't you know i can't i can't do it so inshallah we'll carry on from there next time اللهم انت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا اله الا انت سبحانك انا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمدا ما هو اهله اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا واجعلنا هداة لمن اهتدى اللهم انا نسالك العفو والعافيه في الدين والدنيا والاخره اللهم انا نعوذ بك من الهم والحزن والبخل والجبن والكبر والسحر والمعاصي اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا والممات اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من فتنة المسيح الدجال اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من كل الفتن اللهم جنبنا الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن أو الله accept our good deeds أو الله accept our coming into the masjid أو الله accept our worships that we do أو الله whether they broken or deficient أو الله accept them in the fullest manner أو الله give us the توفيق and the يقين in such a way that we feel more, we feel uh, we, 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 it is easier for us to follow our faith. Oh Allah, we're struggling with many different challenges. Oh Allah, we're struggling with many different challenges. Oh Allah, allow us to strengthen our hearts. Oh Allah, strengthen our hearts and allow our hearts to firmly settle on your faith. Keep them firm on your faith so that it becomes easy for us to follow your deen and to act on all of the all of the orders and instructions that you have given us. Oh Allah, oh Allah, allow us to fulfill all the obligations and to, to, and to avoid all the prohibitions. Oh Allah, make that an easy thing for us to do. Oh Allah, for you, it's, it's just a decision and a decree that you have to make. Oh Allah, for us, it's a lifelong struggle and toil. Oh Allah, make it easy for us. Oh Allah, protect us and our next generation and the generations to come in this country and all around the world. Oh Allah, those Muslims who are under subjugation, oh Allah, remove the subjugation from them. Oh Allah, allow the kalima, your kalima to be elevated around the world. Oh Allah, allow the people who don't understand Islam to understand its beauty. Oh Allah, to leave their aggression against Islam. Oh Allah, to understand the, the beauty and to come into the faith. Oh Allah, oh Allah, you don't need anything. Oh Allah, you don't need anything. But make it easy for us to follow you and to get a place in Jannah al-Firdaus and to seek your pleasure and to attain your pleasure. Oh Allah, grant us goodness in this life and in the hereafter and save us and save us and protect us from the hellfire. Oh Allah, protect us and our children. Oh Allah, forgive us and our children. Oh Allah, forgive us and our families and our teachers and our students and our friends and our relatives. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, forgive us all. O oh Allah, fulfill our pious needs. O oh Allah, all the brothers and sisters, all the men and women in this community and all around the UK and around the world, O oh Allah, bless them. O oh Allah, bless them. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, assist the Muslims and keep us unified. 
O oh Allah, give us unity. O oh Allah, grant us unity. O oh Allah, grant us better days. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us the kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed. O oh Allah, grant us beneficial knowledge and protect us from evil knowledge and from wrong knowledge and from harmful knowledge. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, give us barakah in all the good things that we're doing in our businesses. O oh Allah, in our work, in our studies. O oh Allah, give us barakah and blessing in all of these things and remove the obstacles that we may have in front of us. O oh Allah, grant us full cure from any sicknesses and illnesses that we have. O oh Allah, grant us well-being. O oh Allah, grant us good health. O oh Allah, grant us good health and grant us a place in Jannah. Give us give us the ability to prepare for it before we pass away and before we die. O oh Allah, give us the ability to prepare for it before we die. O oh Allah, subha- oh Allah, allow us to educate the people that are under our charge. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, those brothers who are sitting here and those sisters who are listening at home, O oh Allah, give them good and compromise and understanding, love and affection and barakah and blessing in their in their in their families and in their in their marriages. And those who are not married, O oh Allah, grant them suitable partners. O oh Allah, grant them blessed partners and make that a blessed union. O oh Allah, allow this community to come together and remove all of its problems and all of its turmoil and conflicts and whatever they may be. O oh Allah, let this be a thriving community and all the communities around the world. O oh Allah, allow much guidance to come from here and from the, from uh, around the other places. O oh Allah, give us the kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed and grant us uh, drink from your messenger's hand, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hereafter. O oh Allah, grant us the ability to go over the bridge. O oh Allah, in a fast way without being stuck. O oh Allah, grant us a place in Jannatul Firdaus. Jannatul Firdaus and grant, grant us your pleasure, your everlasting pleasure. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillah. The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, And that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.